The J. Michael Show. Welcome to today's show. Our guest today is Diane Franklin. She's been in several 80s movies and recently has been in Vampire and some other things. We're going to talk to her and uh, find out what she's up to now. Hello, Diane. Hey, how are you? All right. And, uh, well, let's start with right now. I know you just did Vampire. You, uh, you've you been doing a whole lot of things recently. What, what are you up to right now? Thank you for asking about this uh, first. Because most of the time when I get to an end of an uh, interview, uh-huh. it does, it, we don't have time to add it. So I'm really glad you asked. Um, so what happened was um, I've got Vampire coming out this fall. It is a independent uh, feature film, mm-hmm. um, which is based on Bambi, um, the g- cartoon character. What happened was Bambi became a, um, it became the rights came available. Mm-hmm. And so they, they were able to say, well, we want to take this, but no one's ever taken the idea of Bambi and made it into a vampire. So uh-huh. think about Bambi as a vampire. So um, I play um, a teacher and you'll see what I do. And I think it'll make people happy when they see me. Uh, the film is interesting because it's combining a, a very much old school ways of uh, making movies. It's, uh, it's like the old school movies, this sex, violence. Uh, this is not a kid film. Um, comedy, uh, scary and drama and there's a lot going on in this film so i i was so excited to do it because i loved the character that they had for me to play Mm -hmm. and i think everyone is going to enjoy it i i'll give part of it um i play a french teacher so those of you who know the better of dead you will very much enjoy this film for for what i do uh so i'm sort of the uh, instigator of the entire story uh and so it, it's a great film. I think it's going to be uh, out maybe November. I'm not sure. But anyway, so that film is coming out as well as another film, which I did another film called Dead Man's Party. And I don't know if that's the actually going to be the title, but that film is also going to be coming out, I think, October, maybe. I don't mm-hmm. and I think so. Um, unless they have to do like color correction more or sound. And that one, I play a narrator, uh, sort of a female Vincent Price Ah. So that's uh, also, but that movie is like futuristic, it's like sci-fi and crazy. And so that's a very fun cameo. Mm. And then I'm also going to be in a series called uh, Riding with Pride. And Riding with Pride is a a story where I play a mother. I'm in a couple of episodes, I think, or one or two, where I play a mom coming back, uh, not coming back from the dead, Technically, but it's it's not a horror film. It's it's a it's a series um, about a girl who rides horses, and she talks to me for her advice. As her mom, I passed away, and so she, she, there are flashbacks of me giving her advice. So that's more of a I would say drama, All and right. um, and so those those are coming out this fall, which is really exciting because to a certain extent, you know, um, I never expected really to work as much, but it's really nice that a lot of people remember me and that they want me to come back and do work. So yeah, yeah. I'm staying busy. Well, we, you know, we had the uh, producer and one of the actors from Vampire on this show uh, earlier this oh. year. So I was really wanting to get you and your perspective on that movie as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, let me tell you that the thing that really attracted me about the film is that, I mean, it, it was funny. It was pitched to me. The guy who who did it, the uh, the director, he did a movie, a documentary before. So I think this is his first feature film. Mm-hmm. And I always like writer, like, I mean, the, I know the, the woman uh, was directing it, um, but I really like it when the the director and the writers are, connected and everyone is they're not arguing about what's going to be happening they're all in the same mindset and they really wanted to make like a i don't know it's like a the, like a great b movie you know mm-hmm. like a great like a movie that you we don't see anymore um but i i really love that idea like personally for me i like mystery science theater kind of films you know they relax right. me that's Fun to watch, and so I was really into the idea of them making this film. And the idea of vampire as a horror, uh, 
the idea of a, of a, a Bambi being yeah. a horror and a scary thing is absolutely incredible. It's a great idea. It's the juxtaposition of something that's really sweet and trustworthy and lovely to the the perhaps vengeful aspect of it. And uh, so, and then there's animation in it, which reminded me of Better um, Better Off Dead too, whereas there's animation in the film. So I really think it's pushing the boundaries on all levels. Yeah, yeah. And just to bring the audience up to, uh, up to our level right now, you've done, you were Karen in The Last American Divergent. You were in uh, Amityville 2. You were Monique in Better Off Dead. I loved that role. And you were in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. So now let's talk about some of those movies that you did in the 80s. And uh, if you have any antidotes or anything you want to tell us about filming on any or one of those. Sure. Um, you know, it was interesting. I actually, just this past weekend, for example, better off. Oh, um, better. Let me just see some amps. Got a call. I'm just going to get rid of it here. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, eh, let it go. Do you hear it? Mm -mm. Do you do you see something interfering or no? No, I don't. All right, fine. I'll just keep going. So uh, basically, um, what I'm very excited about is uh, just this weekend, mm -hmm. Better Off Dead played on, I don't know, I forgot the channel, IFC or something. And so it just played, it, it was just like we were flipping through channels and it was on television. And I thought, that is just such an incredible present mm -hmm. for me to see that people, that it must have enough viewers or people are interested enough for them to select that film still and play it mm -hmm. and that it still is resonant with people today. So, um, and I personally, that film for me was better off dead to me was such a dear film for me that made me write a book. I wrote a book about better off dead. It took me like two years to write mm -hmm. and it's on Amazon. So if anyone likes it, it's called the, Diane Franklin, you can look up Diane Franklin books, but it's Diane Franklin, the excellent comedy of yeah. the last American French exchange, babe of the eighties, not a title. Um, but I love the movie because it's sweet. It's a feel good movie. And the character I played was a really positive role model. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, we need that, you know, and women need that. Um, I, I just think it's, it's a great thing to see a woman who's very capable Exactly. Um, you know, you could be feminine and, but you, I mean, and anybody, I mean, let's face it, like, you know, it, it's just really great to be capable. Yeah. And, and um, so that, that film I love. Yeah. But what I really think also is interesting about my career is mm -hmm. I've done a lot of indie work. I've also done a lot of television work, but my roles have always been somebody who's, do I, my roles are always quirky and different. Mm -hmm. I mean, even Last American Virgin, although I played the dream girl, I played the main girl in that, that wasn't a mainstream movie. That was a, that was a, um, it's indie, it's not, uh, it's a movie that makes you think. Mm -hmm. It's a movie that's, and, and also my character was so mean, <laughs> so, <laughs> so horrible, and you didn't see it coming. And so when you see my work and you see all the different things I've done, I think people, I think it's interesting. It stays interesting. I hope so. I mm -hmm. hope people, you know, I mean, I've had people go, oh, you know, I can't believe it's the same person. I'm like, that to me is what is the goal is that you see my work and you go, wait, that can't be that same person. Wait, that's somebody different. And, and that's fun for me to, to always create something that's interesting. So when I did Virgin, um, that was my first feature film. Mm -hmm. That was my first, I, and I had the lead right off the bat, but I had worked for so many years before I was really prepared. And I came out to Los Angeles all by myself. Like I flew out here and they put me up at a hotel and I was 19. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't know about a lot of people who would let their 19 year old go off on their own, but I had so much experience that I had been on my own going to New York for auditions for so long that I was really, uh, I knew how to handle myself. I knew how to, to I wasn't naive, you mm. know, as far as work goes. But I think that um, now I look back and I think that was a big deal. You know, not everybody was capable of that. There was a, a group of girls. We all grew up together and we all. And, and by the way, I want to share this information because when people sure. 
get into uh, acting, you're, you've got your peers and you might take classes with people and you might uh, do jobs with people. And, pe- and when you're working, you don't realize that that is the next generation. Mm-hmm. Or if you hang in there, that's the next generation of entertainers. And I've noticed this even, especially in improvisation, a lot of improv, improv people, they work with other people they know because you've developed a trust. And then the careers continue because you keep bringing back those people because you trust them and they represent your work. So back in the 70s, um, I was working with, um, like I do modeling, and I modeled with Brooke Shields, Lori Loughlin, um, Elizabeth Shue I did commercials with, Lori I did commercials with, um, and, uh, oh my gosh, Lizanne Fox and Felice Schachter. I don't know if you know these, she was in Zapped. And like, we all just worked and we all, we just stuck in there and we really worked hard. I mean, all the actresses that I mentioned, you know, we paid our dues. We right. were there since we were little kids, but it's because at that time we really valued what we had. We knew it was, we were given an opportunity. Mm-hmm. So now uh, as we get older, it's like, it's just interesting where everybody wound up going and doing, you know, it's just funny, like watching different people in what their lives have turned into what, what's happened. It's, it's interesting, you know, yeah. for me, because I, I, cause a lot of people, you know, you see what your high school friends do or your college friends and you're like, you know, oh, wow, that's what happened to them. You know, and so I look at actors and I go, oh, that's what's going on with them. Like, you know, yeah. it's kind of a bizarre situation do you uh ever hear from john cusack or some of the stars that uh you were in the 80s movies with do you still communicate with them today yeah um john i saw at a convention a couple of years ago i haven't spoke i don't speak to john but when i do see him he's friendly to me and and he's fine and i um john uh but john was always uh, he was just great in the film. We had a wonderful time, and I have only positive memories of working with him. I mean, really, he was hilarious. And as much as he wasn't a fan, say, of Better Off Dead, I would say, over the years, he is starting to warm up about it. Mm-hmm. And um, I, he's just got different priorities. This is not right. the his, you know his film that that he I think feels represents his best work, or perhaps. But I always looked at him as. This is the movie that people fell in love with him. Um, one of them, you know, he didn't say anything. Um, but I think he he's endearing and sweet in the film. So uh, I have positive memories of him. We did a great job. Who I stay in contact with, um, I E.G. Daly, mm-hmm. um, Amanda Wiss, who played Beth, mm-hmm. uh, Curtis Armstrong, um, and Rit- I mean, from either film, Ritanya Alda. Mm-hmm. Uh, who I did Amityville 2 with her. And she's a lovely woman. And she's actually trying to make a film right now. So if you are interested, Ritanya's trying to raise, she's like raising the end of her funds. Mm-hmm. But if you want to be in the credits, what she does is like, if you contribute to her film, mm-hmm. it's called Land of Mustaches. And uh-huh. it's about her life growing up. So if you are interested in, in, I mean, a lot of things, a lot of people are trying to raise money. That's the world of being in an indie film, you know, right. when you get an independent voice, you need to be supported by the audience more so than, you know, there's no studio paying for money. So I'm just telling you, if you're somebody who likes indies, it means a lot. I mean, it means the world to everybody who's making these films and they'll put your names in credits and they'll, they'll make that effort because or get, you get t-shirts or whatever. Um, I know people who've done that or post sign posters because This is their life dream. Mm -hmm. And so I just want you to know that if you do contribute to an indie film, to anybody who's doing stuff, to their creative process, it means the world to them. And they won't forget you. Like People I know, like they don't forget you. It matters. So anyway, Ritanya is doing this film. And so I I don't know. I'm just sort of spreading the word for her, too, because she's a lovely person and an amazing actress. Yeah. You know, we just, we worked well together, so. Well, I yeah. contributed to Vampire. I don't know if I'm going to end up in the credits, but I did contribute. So I'm hoping that oh. uh, that maybe my <laughs> name will appear in it somewhere. I think it's going to be, I mean, honestly, I think it's going to be huge. Yeah. I think this is going to be the film that people are, it's not just another indie. I think it's going to be huge. Yeah. And, I was in the car. Again, there was another thing, too. Right after I did the film, I come back, 
and I'm listening to K-Rock, I'm listening to music, and all of a sudden they say something like, you know, hey, you know, let's talk about some indie films. And have you heard the new one? Uh, have you heard that Bambi's rights came up? And there's two films about Bambi. And they mentioned one other. And then they bring up, they say, and what about Vampire? And I almost had a car accident. <laughs> I was driving and I went, are you kidding me? Like, I just finished this. And I, I couldn't believe that they were actually start. They already were talking about it. Yeah. So this film is getting a lot it will get a lot of heat and i know it's already gotten some heat so i just let's let's contribute so that we can make it can we can make the best and you can be a part of it i mean to me it's um i don't know how people are but have you ever seen the movie the room no i don't i haven't okay so the room is it was with um the guy who is in the other movie have you ever heard of the disaster artist Mm, i've heard of it i didn't see it though Okay, so there is a, an, uh, an actor, I forgot his name right now, and those of you who know this are screaming his name out to me right now. And I, can't, <laughs> I can't remember it. But basically the idea is The Disaster Artist was a film that was, I think James Franco was, played The Disaster Artist guy. But he, it's about The Room, which is considered one of the best worst movies ever made. Mm-hmm. It's best worst. And... One of the actors who's in that movie is also in Vampire. Um, and I don't know if they, if I, I can say it. So any, But anyway, so the idea is that this film is a... Vampire is... Like, it could be a classic bad film. Yeah. But good. Good bad. Yeah. And I, I mean that with true respect. So, and it's going to be incredibly creative and... I got to tell you, I'm very, very excited about it. And I'm so happy that I got in on it and that mm-hmm. they thought of me because their casting is very unusual. Like it's all over. And so I think people are, I think it's going to be huge in the horror world. I think it's going to be huge, huge. So I'm hope I, I'm, you're not going to regret, you know, being part yeah. of this. Yeah. It's, it reminds me in a little bit uh, of the legend of Boggy Creek from the seventies or the creature from black Lake. They were very low budget mm-hmm. movies, but they're yep. cold classics. Now. I mean, mm-hmm. I still on a rainy Sunday afternoon, will pull one of those movies up and I watch it because it's just, it's like, it's kind of almost like comfort food, you know? Yeah. It, yeah. it is, and it's it, it's feel good kind of like I don't know. It's it, it's a funny thing because you kind of feel safe, mm-hmm. and in a weird way. You know, I mean, the movie is going to be scary, but right. you feel there's a part of indie films and this kind of work. First of all, the people who made this are uh, making Vampire are lovely people, and they totally get the genre, and they're excellent filmmakers, mm-hmm. and they're they are really they're trying to make something epic, mm-hmm. and they're also trying to make it unusual. Uh, and I think that's, it's just, they're, they're thinking big. So yeah. for me, I, I like that. And you don't have to spend a lot of money to exactly. make a great film. To yeah. Make a great film. Well, it, it's, it's like I have, money. as a documentary filmmaker myself, the okay. story is in your head and your heart. It's not in your camera. So you don't have to have an expensive camera. You can take a cheap camera and hand it to um, Francis Ford Coppola or somebody, and he'll make a wonderful movie. And you can take a very expensive camera and hand it to a YouTuber, and he'll create a bunch of cat videos for you. So, yeah, it, it right? it's in your head and it's in your heart. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also what was really nice about the director when he had us uh, had me work is, you know, he lets his actors do their thing. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody was doing like he asked, what's my interpretation and well, how do I want to do it? And I and I want to help make his story the best it can be. So when I do my performance, I try to do it as you know, I try to give it as much of what I think it, this person is. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, well, let's try this. And what about this? And um, and he was really responsive and he liked it. So I think even the smart part I had is very enriched mm-hmm. because we all got to contribute. I mean, but I will tell you when I shot Better Off Dead. There were things in the film, we improvised, not the story or necessarily even the dialogue, but there were things that, I mean, like for instance, Danny, uh, Dan Schneider who played Ricky, grabbing the balloon in the scene, like he jumps up and he grabs it, like that's Danny. Mm -hmm. 
you know, mm-hmm. or like the jello snorting scene. That wasn't in the script. <laughs> we made that up. So wow. all like there's stuff that we create, like, or when I was, I was telling people with the, um, when I would come in with the blindfold on into the restaurant, when John guides me there mm-hmm. to eat, uh, to when Lynn, Lynn takes me to the uh, dinner at the, uh, the pig restaurant. Uh, I forgot what it is called pig. Um, <laughs> but, um, Porky's. Right now. Pork, you're right. Yeah, uh, I don't know what's the name of it. Yeah. Um, but, but the idea is that I was like, no, you, Monique wouldn't just walk into the place. We want to have her, we want, we want to see her be surprised. And so I thought, let's put, just put something over my eyes and let's walk through. So just little things that, that we can add to make our characters richer and more, um, expressive yeah uh that is that's i think what is fun about movie making every minute in front of the camera is valuable to an actor because it should tell you about your character and it's not that you have to push it it just has to be more specific um it can be subtle but it has to be very specific and i love direct i love directors who can take that in um Mm -hmm. i'll say that it's there's many types of ways of, of making a film sometimes people make a film they go the story is the focus and you know, everything focuses to the story and we need the dialogue to be accurate because the dialogue is going to tell us the backstory and, and it's going to give us the, you have our imagination um, expand and visualize what what's happening in the scene. Mm -hmm. But then there are times where a movie can be more character centric where the characters, the more real and the more expressive they are, the more we are involved in the story through an emotional, the emotional impact of the characters. So right. to me, I, I, uh, I feel like, you know, when I have a director who appreciates the actor, just getting into the character heavily and, and really getting into it. Um, I go crazy. I lose it. I, yeah. I'm very happy. Yeah. One, one of the funniest scenes in better off dead. And I will remember this till the day I die where the, Cusack and the other guy are on top of a mountain and he looks down at the snow and he goes do you realize the street value of this mountain and I I started busting out laughing and I thought that's the most hilarious and I wondered is that was that ad-libbed or was it in the script you know I don't know about that um that's a very good question. It was funny, like years ago, we went and we did a, a sit-down reading of the original script of Better Off Dead. Uh-huh. I don't remember if it was in there. I, I, I feel like it was. Mm-hmm. But the way Curtis did it was so hilarious. Yeah. He had the best lines. Curtis Armstrong, who played um, the... the Lane, um, It was Lane Meyer and... Oh, gosh, now this is terrible. What What's... Uh, he was like the would-be drug dealer of the neighborhood. Yeah. He didn't really yeah. have any drugs. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Oh, it was. Um, well, I'm just gonna say Curtis, but the the actor who played his friend was. Oh, I can't believe I can't remember this. That's scary. Uh, it's he. He had the best lines. Mm-hmm. I mean, everything from, you know, I've been going to this high school for you know twelve years or whatever. You know, I you know. <laughs> Oh, gosh, the line. But the idea of him being a, a guy who never left high school and he's still there. And we all know someone like that. That's like, right. I mean, I guess now people aren't left behind. But that is is such a great line and such a, yeah. a we can relate to that. So yeah. funny. And Monique, of course, she was the French exchange student. And they were like. Do, do people walk up to you and literally go French fries, you know, or, or do oh. that to you? <laughs> Um, you know, uh, do they come, you know, they don't, Ah. but they do love my character and Mm -hmm. they, people do come up to me and, you know, I'll, I'll be the one who says, you know, Christmas, you know, and, uh, or I want my $2, you know, Oh yeah. say that, um, uh, so, you know, or it goes that way really fast. If something gets in your way, you know, so, uh, but there are classic lines from that film. And I think people, I've heard people come to me and say that they actually use the lines from Better Off Dead. Oh, Charles DeMar. Yeah. I knew I'd remember Charles DeMar. Um, that's uh, Curtis Armstrong played uh, Charles DeMar. Yeah. But um, people have come up to me and say that they actually quote Better Off Dead in mm-hmm. their normal life. Yeah, and I have. Sav- Savage Steve Holland, he wrote the script mm-hmm. and 
and he created these characters. He is one of the sweetest guys. Yeah. And I, it, it, his, that script is such a example of who he is. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I, that is just such an unusual script. And yet, and it's still funny. And Savage was funny. And when we worked with him, he was so funny. And he was 24 when he directed Better Off Dead. He was a kid. Yeah. He was uh, one of the youngest directors ever before everyone was directing, right? Right. Um, And and the the little boy, he nailed the bicycle thing where he would, uh, you know, take the comb out, comb his hair. I want my $2. You know, that that just, it sticks out. It's one of those movies that has so many memorable lines in it. Yes. And uh, I love, it's the paper boy. Um, (laughs) I love that character. And that, I mean, I think somebody even made tried to make a video game with that because it was so funny. Mm-hmm. You know, I really love hearing that you love the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, even today. I mean, it's been so long. People watch it like for Christmas or they watch it for mm-hmm. Valentine's Day. Uh, I just hope, I really, well, it was funny because you just said like, I really wonder what film people will remember me. What will be that film that people would remember me from? Yes. Yeah. Because I'll get people who, like one day I did a survey, I said, what do you think I'll be remembered for? And people like, it was pretty bizarre. It was split up. Some people said Amityville. Some people said Better Off Dead. Some people said Last American Virgin. Mm-hmm. And then people said Bill and Ted's too. But it was just like, I don't know. I wonder. It'll be interesting. I love yeah. Better Off Dead. I hope I'm remembered for that. But I do understand why I'd be remembered for the other ones. And it just really has to do with where the culture is, where, yeah. where the world is, you know, yeah. what's their priority. And also, it's amazing that this is, uh, I mean, this is a movie from the 80s, and yet we still remember all the lines from it. Yes. They just come right back to us. They're like, you know, I want my $2. (laughs) Uh, Now it would probably be, I want my $200, right? (laughs) Yeah, it would be a lot more than that. Okay, so uh, another question for you, and this is something you alluded to earlier, you gone from not only being a wonderful actress but a writer you've written three books already tell me about your books okay thank you for asking Mm -hmm. um i i never um you know i have a lot of ideas for things Mm -hmm. and i never said to myself i want to be a writer Mm -hmm. but i thought i want i need to write this i need to get this out because i really think that i wanted to make sure i was that came from me directly because mm-hmm. I think sometimes when things get passed down from one person to another, the truth obviously gets moved and changed as we right. go down, you know? And I really thought if anybody else wants to be an actor, if they, or if they love these films, they, it, maybe people are interested in what it's like. So that's what got me to start writing. And usually when I write, it takes about two years mm-hmm. because I, I know, isn't that funny? Like, I'm not going, oh, I have to get it out in a month, you know. I, it, I sit with it. I get my ideas. I, um, and I approach it where I'm a, a creator for half of it and then I'm an editor for the second half. Right. So I, I try to get all my ideas and I try to open it up and then I try to say, well, why would anyone want to read this? What's my point? And then once I figure that out, then I move on to the second half, which is what can I, I've got all this information. I'm going to cut this, keep this. Um, but what's really the point? Does it matter? You know? So I do have other ideas for some other books. Uh-huh. And, uh, but the, I, one thing I did know is when I did write it, I wanted it to be like a coffee table book. Right. And I thought I'll start with that. And then when I'm sort of making more, I'm like, okay, well, I didn't, again, I did really didn't think I was going to make a second book, but my first book is, if you do not know who I am, who Diane Franklin is, my first book is an autobiography, mm-hmm. but it's written in the tone as if you are in the 80s. Uh-huh. So you're going to get the lingo and the language and my thoughts as if I was that age, you know, yeah. like what my experience is. And it's really for people, I, I, I was funny because I wrote it and I, um, wrote the chapters like PG, R, you know, <laughs> I like it. and by the way, those of you who don't know what R is, it means restricted, which is probably mature. Right. Um, but like, I thought if a parent gets this book, cause they're the ones who are going to want to buy it. They know, okay. It's not that anything is that, you know, outrageous, but it does have subject matter that might be a little, you know, they maybe parents may not want to discuss with their kids yet. Yeah. So I kind of did that in the first book. Um, and then the second book was about more like la- uh, more about va- Last American Virgin, and it mm-hmm. is called 
The first one's called The Most Excellent Adventures um, of the Last American French Exchange Babe of the 80s. And the second one is called The Excellent Curls, although my hair is strained today, uh, of the Last American French Exchange Babe of the 80s. That one, um, I realized that Last American Virgin, I had not finished that story. And I thought there was a lot to it. There was a lot of information. And I really felt like I needed to, I needed to get deeper into that story Mm -hmm. because that was more of that film. When you see it, it is so deep. And that's the film. Like if I go to a convention, I will have guys come up to me and they will be like, I, I hated you. I loved you. I hated you. I loved you. Like I just, (laughs) I'll get that kind of like, or that happened to me or people, guys so relate to that film. And I really, Mm -hmm feel very fortunate that they can come to me and get closure too. And, you know, it, it's, I didn't, I w- didn't do that film casually. That film was from my heart and I gave my heart to do that. So when people come up to me and talk about it, it means something to me, it means something. And uh, I know, cause I know it means something to them. It, 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 there's no way you can't watch that film without being affected. So that was the second book. And then, excellent comedy of the last American French exchange babe of the eighties is better off dead, but I might do one on horror. I might do uh might do an acting book. I might do a, um, and people have asked me also, well, what about a movie? It's, you know, screenplay. Um, I have ideas for a series. So I do have some ideas of things to write, but I'm not looking to be, um, I'm looking for an idea that best expresses who I am. Also, the other thing is, um, I was thinking maybe at some point I would do a documentary of my life uh-huh. um, because a lot of people have done that. And I thought maybe that might be something people would be interested in. Do you have a, have a lot of footage from the, those time periods, something you could put into do. a documentary? Yeah. yeah, A lot of I home do. movies I and do. things. Mm-hmm. I have some old footage that I could use. And um, I have things that people haven't seen. Uh-huh. So that's kind of an interesting thing. And also just, I I talk about my life, but there's always more. Mm-hmm. I'm a very interesting person. I've had a lot of things happen to me. So you I are. Just, you're definitely. Are you, are you one of these people when you're writing your book or, or working on something like this, that you have a hundred different post-it notes on the wall? Um, I, no, I actually, I ha- have it in my brain, but I will uh-huh. say, I don't know. I don't put it all in place, but I do. I do. Um, I used to put in the computer, take my computer with me and write, just write, 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 write. Mm-hmm. But before I do that, I just do like bullet points, like, oh, that story and that story and that story. So I remind, I remind myself of the situation of the epic, you know, the thing. But what's very funny is I, I come up with ideas for ideas for films and books all the time. Mm-hmm. And I put them in my phone. And so I have stories and things that I haven't developed, but I have ideas. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm more about, I really like the performance aspect. I'm not looking to produce my things unless, I don't know, the circumstance has to be right. So, but I appreciate you noticing about the books because a lot of people don't have the energy or the focus or the thing they want to say. Maybe they would have the one to say, but they're thinking someone else is going to write it for them. And I feel like although it is difficult to write something, no one's going to write it better than you. No one's going to care about it as much as you. So even when I got my editors for my books, Mm -hmm. the guy who's who was editing Michael Piccarella loves 80s movies. Mm -hmm. So I found somebody who would read it with a kind heart and Mm -hmm. not be somebody who was either just doing it as a job right. or doing it to um, or doing it with attitude like, well, no one's going to be interested in that. or Don't do that. Or do, you know, that's not what it's about. It's got to be somebody who loves 80s films and understands the center of what we all do. We, you know, I love 80s films there. There's a gentleness and a sweetness and a kindness and a sexiness mm-hmm. um, and a fun that I, I mean, we all never realized would be gone. Right. Different. Right. And whoever imagined that the films that we have today, we, we, we never imagined that those films would be unusual or different. Right. We, we, I, but I think every generation feels that. 
You yeah. know, people, the old movie stars were like, these are the films we'll make forever and we'll have studio contracts. And then studio contracts didn't come. And then we did like indies. And how interesting that our culture has tr- changed. We, You know, people go to film school, young people go to film school. They want to grow up and be filmmakers. And when they get to film school, the film school says, great, you want to make movies, but what about video games? And you're like, wait, yeah. what? <laughs> like, yeah. wait a minute. What is happening, right? So we, the world has changed so much. And what we put on a pedestal sometimes is now, it, nostalgia is, is you appreciate what you do when, you, when you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Because it might be gone the next minute. Exactly. Know? Yeah. And uh, also a, a question for you. Has the digital age uh, changed for the better or for the worse how movies are made? That's a great question. Uh, and I feel good about answering that since I'm uh, 62. So <laughs> I've had some life experience. Uh-huh. And coming from television, coming from before VHSs, coming from when you only could go to the theater. And there's probably a lot of your um, audience who has had that same experience, right? We've, we've gone to the movies. That was the only way we could see entertainment. We snuck into those those rated R films. We had to because otherwise we'd never see, you know, those films. Mm-hmm. Um, we paid good money to go to them. So here's what I think. Um, I think that there's a lot of great things about the video age. Um, First of all, the fact that we can, I can see Better Off Dead or we can see any film really we want to that's been saved anytime we want, right? Mm-hmm. Like that is an incredible gift. And we can even sometimes manipulate it to a certain extent. Like you can take clips of films and people can show their fandom by creating something from it. Mm-hmm. You know, like they can, like I saw somebody who, who made Better Off Dead, they took the clips, they added a different soundtrack, and they made it like, what if Better Off Dead was a horror film? (laughs) And I thought, that is so cool. It was brilliant. They did a great job. So that is very fun. I really like to see the creativity. Um, I think it really has to do with where your heart is and what you do with the material. And so with like any new medium, if you're not coming from a... A, 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 a helping others and, and a, a good place, you can destroy anything, mm-hmm. you know? So the medium, like the AI and all this stuff, people are very uh, ner- nervous about it. Well, it's just because people who are actors who've done it for their whole life and who've sacrificed for their life, they still want to get paid for yeah. what they did. People, t- again, t- today actors will get paid um, for they'll get paid in residuals and those residuals are not happening. They're not a lot, but they still want to be, it's like, imagine somebody taking, you know, your likeness and just doing whatever they want with it and not, you're not getting compensated. So that's not fair, but we, but I also, so there's difficulties with it and we need to get compensated. Actors need to be paid for what they did. Their likeness, they're creating um, the people are creating their own vision of, Um, like the actors, like for instance, we create the idea of people to, to produce other material. We're the muse, Mm -hmm. okay, of, of maybe other people. So, you know, I just think out of the, out of consideration and out of being a good person, you want to be respectful to people in the past. But is that true? No, because culture has changed a lot. Yeah, and we'll see. You know, life. It, it go, I, I work with kids. I teach kids, and I, I see that a lot of kids need, they need parents. You know what I mean? They need guidance. They need someone who cares. And if they get that, and they get, they if they learn how to just be more, um, if they're treated with respect and they're given some boundaries themselves they will learn respect back. And I just, it's just interesting. I work with kids. They love working with me. I think we have a great time. It's super fun. And I'm, I, 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 it's, I think it's because I enjoy what I do. I love acting. I love drama and I can, I want to help the next generation. Right. I get back, but I don't see that necessarily with the, uh, with how they treat others in the yeah. adult world. Yeah. Do you think that in the future we will see a movie 
that literally has no actors in it because they're all CGI, no oh. voiceovers in it because AI is doing it, no musical mm-hmm. soundtrack because a computer generated the soundtrack. The entire movie, 90 minute movie from start yeah. to end is nothing but an illusion created by a computer. Do you think that day's coming? Um, yeah. Uh, and if it does, it'll be a, a flash. Mm-hmm. It'll be, look at these films, watch them for a few, and then go, you know what? We're on to back to people. Because right. there is no way that a film that has all those, it's like um, a video game. You mm-hmm. can play a video game for the sake of the game, and you know that those characters aren't real, mm-hmm. but it's a fad, and it will go. Yeah. So people are always, humanity and people and behavior will always go, we will always go back to that. Because, because we are humans, and we're always looking for, the sensory aspect of that. Exactly. The smelling, the hearing, the tasting, the touching. That's, yeah. you can't get away from that. So if you watch it uh, for an AI film and everything is, you know, fake, you'll know it's fake. You'll say, oh, it's like a cartoon. It'll yeah. be a fad. It's like anime, like anime or something. You're going to watch it and you're like, oh, okay, that's really artistic. That's really fun. Yeah. It's like puppets. Like, okay, great. Those are wonderful. I appreciate that. But it doesn't give you the same thing as a real person. Yeah, so I I, I, you know I, I mean? fear it's the real. day may come where where yep. you cannot go to a convention and meet meet <gasps> you a star you know that's been in a movie because there is no human being that was in that movie, and we oh, will as right. a culture we need that we need to be able to have the chance of maybe walking into a restaurant and there's Diane Franklin and I'm like oh my gosh I'm going to walk over there and say hi to her you know because she was in so Better Off Dead yes. yeah and I I fear that we're going to lose that and I that's, that's a sad. very good point that's you sad. know I, I didn't even occur to me though like you if that if that was a fa- fa- phase or we'll be visiting the people who made that movie oh you created that character oh you made that AI film yeah well, well, I guess they didn't. The computer did, right? Yeah. You're right. There's, yeah. but even if that's the case, yeah, no, it's it's definitely not, not as not, not worth anything, really, right? Yeah, it's not yeah. Worth I think that if AI movies do become a thing, you're going to have two different Hollywoods. You're going to have the AI stuff, and that people will go and watch it just for the heck of it. But they're right. really going to go back to the film noir, the the way movies are made or used to be made, as they'll say, and yeah. the real Emotional people that are. Movies. The, Emotional movies. Yes. Relationships. Like, yes. you know, you if you have an AI movie based on a relationship, like I can understand AI in terms of like action or like you do something unbelievably dangerous. A, a building blows up, the sky blows up, a mountain blows up, the, you know, the, the a planet blows up. I could see, okay, AI just like any special effects film, you know, would be safer and, you know, whatever it's, it's like a a video game, but for, but for the relationship stuff, we want to see the real people experience that Mm because we are that we, I mean, when you watch a film, how often don't you look at a film and go, I'm that person. Yes. You know, I, I, if I was in this movie, I'd be that person. Yes. And you're not going to say that to an AI thing. You're going to, because it's too perfect. Or yeah. whatever, it's too designed. Yeah. You're going to say, I'm, you know, I want to see a real person. So I don't, wouldn't worry about it. It's, it's just a, I think it's just a, fa- a phase, yeah. you know. There's been a lot of phases. Um, yeah. But humans win always in the end. Like human nature, humanity wins somewhere along the line. Do you think um, that you would enjoy being in a movie where most of the characters turn into their automobiles that turn into robots or something like that? Would you want to do uh, that? You know, that's a great question because I would love to do an action film. I'd love to do a sci-fi film. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd love to do more, more historical films like period pieces just to have the experience. I like the idea of futuristic films, uh, something you know a a world and that's another idea i had for a movie something about my idea of the future which i think is that that's a cool anything that having to do with the vision of what you think the world is going to become Mm -hmm. i think is is interesting um or on another planet or something like that but i i feel for the actors who are acting in things now because they have to they have to act with monsters that aren't real and they have to act with 
with special effects and green screens mm. where when I even did terror vision, there was a real monster there and yeah. it was dripping with gl- slime and I got to act with it. Yeah. I mean, I, I cannot even imagine we, I mean, I, as an actor, imagine who I'm talking to in a scene, but uh, if that person's not there, yeah. but I can't, I don't know. It would just be kind of, it's, it's definitely sad, you know, yeah. for the actor. Yeah, so much stuff today is green screen, and you're standing there and you're acting, and there's nothing, there's nobody there next to you. You're just acting to thin air. And I often wonder, like, how do they pull it off where they actually look like they're looking right at the character, even though they know that character is not there? That's acting. That's the imagination. Mm -hmm. That's the believability. It's the relationship. You know, I just think it's, um, and they have to visualize what they would be going through if they went. If let's say they were in a situation, you know, let's say you have a big dinosaur after you, how would you react and where are you looking and what's yeah. your, you know, what's your take in, I don't know. Um, but I do think that to me, um, like a scene, those are so bigger than life, mm-hmm. but I think maybe it's good to have a movie that you're just talking to someone and maybe you're dealing with actually uh, a relationship or something uncomfortable or there's, you know, you have that eye contact, that moment, again, the sensory thing, yeah. what you're feeling, smelling, tasting, hearing, you know, those, that's what is also still so exciting. And so it, it can rock you as big as like a, a, a big action scene, you know? Yeah. So uh, I'm, I feel very fortunate that I acted when I did. Um, and I still act in movies now. I mean, I've actually wound up doing a lot of horror more recently. Aside from uh, B- Vampire, mm-hmm. I've done a movie called Waking Nightmare. I did Amityville Murders. Um, so I've done those. Oh, I also did, which is kind of funny. This is, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Prank Panel. No. So Prank Panel is a Johnny Knoxville and Eric Andre Mm-hmm. Uh, are the, were the hosts. I don't even know if it's still on, but I did the pilot episode and my daughter was on it and it's a, it's a prank show. It's a reality show. So I was mm-hmm. done a reality show, which is very fun, very different. Yeah. And um, I played the mother of the bride. My, and my daughter is actually in real life. My daughter, Olivia, who is a comedian, she's on TikTok. Mm-hmm. She's like a TikTok famous under Sid, S-Y-D, and Olivia. Mm-hmm. So if you check stuff out, she's amazing. And she is... Uh, plays the bride in the movie. And they, Johnny, um, Eric Andre's, um, sorry, uh, Johnny Knoxville thought of me to play her mother, said, would you know, would you like, uh, can Diane play her mother? And I was like, oh, yes, absolutely. You know, I was uh, really happy that they agreed to have me come. And I went and played her mother. But it's such a funny episode. So there's another genre. Like you go, well, reality, television, how do you, that's so strange too. There's no script. You have to be good at improv. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was fun. I really liked the experience of it. And I like to work with my daughter. So yeah. that was great. Have you ever done a scene with someone that as soon as the scene is over and they, they shout cut, you walk away and you said, Oh my God, that was like so awesome, so real. Oh yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Well tell me when about I this. Meet, oh yeah. You know, doing a scene. Uh, it, there's a couple of interesting moments as an actor. One is you do a scene and you are warming up. Like you feel like you're warming up mm-hmm. and you do it. Um, and you, you think, Oh, okay, I'm going to do it one more time. And everybody goes, that was amazing. Yeah. And you go, are you really, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> because to me, like I, how it feels I'm warming up, but they were like, no, that was up. And I've had that experience. Mm -hmm. And then there's been other times where I've gone in and went, all right, this is it. And I, I can, I just feel it. And it's like, it's sometimes I'll do it and it'll feel like uh, playing musical notes. Mm -hmm. It's like, you're going, okay, I hit this beat. I hit that. I hit this relationship and stuff. And in, in your head, what you have to do is you have to plan everything in your head. For me, I plan Mm -hmm. everything in my head. And then, I throw it all away and I just am in the moment. And when, and if I'm really connected, it all pops and it all just, 
you know, the tears flow in the moment, you know, and yeah. the hits and it's, and I, that's to me a very exciting acting yeah. is, I'll share this with you. You know how people get awards for things, right? Awards, getting an award is not even a tiny bit close to the satisfaction an actor gets from the experience of doing it. Wow. Not even close. People might say, you're great, you're wonderful. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. What means matters is the moment of doing I mean, I'm saying it's nice to get an award. It's nice to be appreciated by your peers. But when you live life to the fullest, no matter what you do, I mean, you if you work with kids or if you work with elderly people or, you, or you're a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, you're doing your job. When you give your all, mm -hmm. there's nothing like that feeling of accomplishment and confidence that you get from that. And right. you go, you know what? I, I'm proud of myself. I did that. That was I nailed it. And um, yeah. I do that sometimes on auditions. I'll have an audition where I'll say, I don't know if I'm right for this part. I may not be right for this part. But when people see this, what I did, I know that they're going to be surprised because I'm yeah. going to knock them out of the park. Wow. So, uh, yeah. And I'll, and yeah. so I've done some incredible auditions because I, and I've worked really, really hard on them because I, again, I have my own standards and I consider it training. My yeah. auditioning process is still my training where I, practice and I try different things and as an actor I'm always growing I'm playing different roles you know and I'm, I'm ex playing people of different experiences so that is a, an incredibly exciting thing and I have to tell people you only get what you what you put in emotionally right you know if yeah. you if you're just putting it in through you know oh yeah just going through the motions you're only yeah. get you're not going to get that much back. But if you yeah. put in, and it's just like anything in a real relationship, yeah, you got to take chances, and yeah, you could get hurt, but that's life. And Have you ever done a scene where um, you walked away from the scene thinking to yourself, "Oh, that was a disaster," and it turns out huh? to be one of the most <laughs> iconic moments of the entire movie you did? Oh, that's a funny thing. God, I was like, oh, yes, uh -huh. I do. And, uh, I'll tell you when it was was um, in Amityville. I have a scene and I have to say the, the lines. Um, and those of you who've seen the film, I'm sure you're going to see it uh, now. Um, I say the lines, my panties. And that line to me at that moment, what's happening is my brother in the scene is amorous towards me in this film. That's what makes that Amityville too unusual new movie. If you haven't seen it. There's incest in the movie mm -hmm. and it's done very real. And the writer had me say those, that line, my panties. And I was like, Oh, if I was really in that moment, I wouldn't say anything. Yeah. You wouldn't say yeah. one word. So here I am trying to like, how am I going to say this line without it being ridiculous? It's, mm -hmm. it's, and and to this day, like, I mean, I do think like people might start laughing at that moment because they get nervous because it's uncomfortable. The whole thing is very awkward to watch. Right. But that moment, I remember doing it and going, I found a way to do it because I had to play it very innocent. And but it was still like as an actor, when you get lines that are not organic to the scene and you have to say them, I always some actors are like, I'm not going to say that line. I'm just going to say whatever makes sense. And they just brush it off. But because it was at the beginning of my career, I was really not as confident. And I thought, well, you have to. I mean, certainly at that time in, in the 80s, you were more, as far as I went, bound as a newcomer to say exactly what the lines were. You couldn't improvise. You couldn't make up what you wanted. It wasn't considered professional. Right. So maybe today everybody improvises. Uh, actors have to learn to improvise. Directors say, "Learn to improvise." You, we need to do this scene, and I won't just do be more in your character. So actors have to learn differently than they did when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. But at that time, you had to be specific. You had to get those lines right. And you have to find meaning, and you had to you had to make it work. Mm -hmm. So in that case, that was hard. That was a really hard moment. I was like, oh, "Am I going to make this work?" So if you do see it, at least you'll know that I was thinking about it. Um, that was a tough one. <laughs> you, you were cringing in that moment. Any other cringe yeah. moments from your career that you can think of? 
Let's see. What cringe moments? Or or extremely happy moments. Mm, happy moments. Well, the scene where Mrs. Smith squeezes my face and says, <laughs> Chris Smith. Dying. We were dying. It was so... First of all, she looked so uh, like great. And Laura Waterbury, who played Mrs. Smith, as a person, you know, she would talk normally. You know, she would say, hi, how you doing? She was very friendly, um, sweet woman. Mm-hmm. But when she put on this voice of Mrs. Smith, Ricky, Ricky, <laughs> we die. And she, we all, that scene where we're all on the couch, we had to stay so straight faced. And the, I always say the camera crew and the people who were filming us in Savage, they were shaking, like they were like, and trying not to show how, not to, you hear their laughter. I would see from the corner of my, I see people like going, oh, like they did not want to show their laughter, you know? Uh-huh. So, and for me, oh, it was so funny. We had to do so many takes to not laugh. Or yeah. we, when we did the scenes too, we would like hold it and then we'd all burst out into laughter. Yeah. Um, and even he did. We all did. Um, that film, there were so many moments where that we were holding it in. Yeah. So uh, there's, and many, all actors, if you're doing comedy and something's funny, I got to believe you die. I mean, for instance, Will, Will Ferrell, I got to believe that whenever people work with him, people just lose it and they're trying to not laugh. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, but that's a joy. That's like a, when you work on a comedy with people that are really funny, I really think you're, you're doing, you're a lucky position as an actor. It's right. pretty hilarious. It's very fun. Is there so, a better uh, off dead blooper reel? No, because, and that was the other thing. At that time, people didn't save all this stuff. You know, Better Off Dead never had any special features. And that's why I made my book. Because I knew all this information. In fact, Savage Steve Holland, when I told him I was writing the book, and I asked him, I said, do you mind if I write it? I mean, I know it was your story in your book. And and he's like, oh, my gosh, Diane, no, absolutely. And I said, well, do you have any information maybe that you'd like me to share? And he sent me like 30 pages. He sent me so much stuff. Uh And I... There was stuff I didn't even know. So wow. that's why I highly recommend the book, because if you love that film, you're going to find out things you n- never knew. And you're that it, it really is a time capsule. It's like going back in time. Okay. So I really valued it. And then I interviewed the um, I interviewed as many people as I could because I thought, oh, you know, this is a moment in time. I really wanted to interview Laura Waterbury and Kim Darby. Yeah. Kim Darby wasn't doing interviews anymore. Laura B- Waterbury had passed. So um, and and so did David Ogden Steyer, who mm-hmm. played the dad. So all these people. I, but I got the paper boy. Uh, I got Curtis, Amanda, um, you know Beth, uh, Cur- Charles Demar, the paper boy, um, John. I I didn't get, but I did talk about my experiences with him. Mm-hmm. Um, and Savage Savage wrote about his experiences with John. So there's a lot in it. Yeah. And it's a very kind and sweet book. You're not, you're not going to find in Better Off Dead, this that world wasn't. Oh yeah, well he did this and she did that. That's not what we were all about on that film. You mm-hmm. know, the, and it, I think it's pretty rare. You don't normally do a film where everybody is still loving each other and think you know had a great time. That film was very special. So if somebody wanted one of your books, uh, what's the best link to go to? And we will put links under this show to go to okay. all of your stuff. But uh, tell me how to go Thank about you. getting really your books. That's really sweet of you. I appreciate it. I, that's really, really sweet. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if you don't want it signed, you can go to Amazon. And that's mm-hmm. the cheapest way to go for it, Amazon. And you can get it anywhere. Even I think in the UK, you can even order it from Amazon. Mm-hmm. But if you want it signed by me, I, I only do domestic signing because... Um, it's just prohibitively expensive. It's twice the price. So I do in the U.S., you go to dianefranklin.com and I have all these different pages. I have photos of me there as well. I should put some new photos up. I've only had a few uh, up there, but but you can also get my book signed. And if you get it signed, what I'll do is once you send in your order and you pay for it, um, I have an assistant. She'll contact you and then you'll... uh, You'll tell me if you who you want it made out to, and if you have a personalization you want it to. So, 
Um, and then I also do cameos. If you yeah. want something, I'm on cameo. And if you want something special for someone, um, I have the original Better Off Dead coat. And so I do like, you know, special things for that. I'll do a Bill and Ted's one um, or an Amityville one. I had somebody ask me to do it from like Amityville possession kind of thing. So, uh -huh. um, yeah, any character that I play that you like, uh, I can do a cameo from that, you know, from that character, too. Right. So right. Uh, it's pretty cool. I found you via Instagram. I love your Instagram. And in fact, in fact, I think sometimes you. your daughter is on your Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, well, she, OK, so my daughter, Olivia, is an amazing comedian, but she's also beautiful. Yeah. She, she's beautiful. Yeah. And, she takes um, after you. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> I just think she's just gorgeous. But anyway, th thank you. I'll take that. Um, people I do find sometimes people go, oh, my God, you look so much alike, which I love when I see other moms and their daughters. Like I go, oh, that's so cool. Like I can see that. Um but there are some times where I look at old pictures of myself and I go, uh -huh. wow, that was that Olivia or me. So sometimes there'll be so it's nice when people see the resemblance. Yeah. Um, and basically for her, she is uh, she's got a lot of stuff in the fire. She is she's been working on with comedy forever, you know, and but she's she has her own style and they actually are. TikTok famous, like I said, um, under Sid and Olivia, mm -hmm. and they have a, a TV series. Um, they have a YouTube show if you're interested called Sugar Babies. They have a Snapchat show was called Apocalypse Goals, but that might now be. I think it's actually now on YouTube. Apocalypse Goals, you can check it out. But it was done in like a Snapchat style, okay. um, and they're just absurdist comedy. And so, wow. um, but she's got a lot of stuff going. She's been in movies. She's been in. Um, Ted Bundy, American uh, horror film, Ted Bundy, uh, uh, American, um, you know, yeah, Ted Bundy, it is called, uh, Boogie, um, American Boogeyman, that mm -hmm. by Daniel Ferens, he was the director. And she's, um, she was in the prank panel, and she's done some prank stuff. So just look up Olivia De Laurentiis, and you will see she does that. And then my son is a musician. He's a classical musician. Mm -hmm. He plays the upright bass, and his name is Nick De Laurentiis. And he's also on Spotify, and he has his own music. And he's also in a band called Swatches. So uh, my kids are, um, it, oh, and then my husband, I'm, done, I'm married, is uh, he uh, writes, uh, wrote for Fairly Odd Parents, the cartoon. Ah. He was the writer. So we're very creative family, very artistic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll have to get your daughter on the show and maybe do an interview with her, too. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Well, I'll tell her. I think okay. she'd love to. Well, that's going to end it. I, is there anything that I did not ask you that you wanted to talk about? You're amazing. I, I appreciate everything, the way you did the interview, too, because um, it, it's sometimes these, these things can go on and on, and I, I really appreciate how you are interviewing. Um, Thank you. I would just want to say... Um, Right now, a sincere thank you to anyone who is a fan of my work and merci, Vakits. Uh, you are fantastic and uh, I, I appreciate you always. And um, I, I just want to say, even as Princess Elizabeth, um, party on and be excellent to each other. All right? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Don't go anywhere, but that's going to do it for us. Thank you so much for watching The J. Michael Show with Diane Franklin, and we'll be back next week with another episode. See you then. Goodbye.